Good. Well, then we are ready. It is 2-22-2022 for our City Council work session on Tuesday. Uh, calling to order. Notice to the public that uh, City Council may vote to go into executive session on any of the agendized items uh, for legal advice. Roll call, please. Mayor Deasy. Here. Vice Mayor Daggett. Here. Councilmember Aslan. Here. Councilmember McCarthy. Here. Councilmember Salas. Present. Councilmember Shimoni. Here. Councilmember Sweet. Here. All right. Well, let's uh, go with some of the folks in at the dais here for our Pledge of Allegiance and uh, so forth. So, uh, Councilman McCarthy, would you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, and then we'll go to the mission statement by Councilman Braston. I would. Uh, please stand if you can. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank Mr. You, Mayor, the, uh, the statement of purpose for the city of Flagstaff is the mission of the city of Flagstaff is to protect and enhance the quality of life for all. Thank you. And um, if uh, Council Member Solace, if you could uh, please read our land acknowledgement. I am honored to do so, Mr. Mayor. The Flagstaff City Council acknowledges the ancestral homelands of this area's indigenous nations and original stewards. These lands, still inhabited by native descendants, border mountains sacred to indigenous peoples. We honor them, their legacies, their traditions, and their continued contributions. We celebrate their past, present, and future generations who will forever know this place as home. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Salas. Uh, we're down to agenda item number four, our public participation. Do we have any public participants at this time? Mayor, we do not have any at this time. Thank you. Well, that brings us to agenda item five, our review of draft agenda for the March 1st, 2022 City Council meeting next week. Uh, Council, do we have any questions, concerns, uh, comments on the draft agenda? I am not seeing any at this time. So that would bring us to the uh, item of the hour, our museum flood project updates. Agenda item number six. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, Scott Overton here, Public Works Director. And with me this evening is our usual uh, group of friends and family that we get to visit with about all things museum flood related in the Spruce Wash. You'll be hearing from a number of us this evening. Um, Director Bertelson will be here shortly as he is in transition from the Water Services Office. Uh, we have Julie Lead here from Peak Engineering, Sarah Langley from our Information Office, Ed Shank from Stormwater, Gary Miller from our Water Services Division as an engineer, Sam Beckett, our Streets Director, and Rick Barrett's in the back for those really technical questions. And we'll have a couple friends with us online, I'm sure, as well about this topic. Um, We, of course, will welcome questions and comments and concerns as we move through this. But tonight, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking in addition to not only some museum efforts, but some of the flood cleanup work that is occurring outside of museum. We've been getting a number of questions about some of the work on Appalachian and uh, in the western part of the community um, from this last summer's events. So we're gonna give you a little bit of update on where some of those outlying projects are. And then we're primarily gonna jump into the meat of the flood topic, which of course will be the museum, short, mid, and long-term mitigation measures and where we're at. We're gonna spend a decent amount of time with Julie Lead from Peak Engineering to discuss our feasibility efforts 
Uh, we had a number of questions that wanted to get a little bit more into detail, so we're going to allow her some extra time tonight to really focus in on that feasibility study as we now have received the final version and we're in review. Uh, we felt it was a very timely topic to discuss what the results of the feasibility study are and how it's going to look uh, in the coming months. Our friends from Coquino County will likely be online. I do believe they had a board of supervisors meeting, but uh, Lucinda and Christopher will be with us. Look, there he is. He just appears on the giant screen. Christopher and Lucinda will be here to visit with us about the Parkway sediment basins. And then we'll spend uh, a couple moments to speak with probably Christine Cameron online and uh, our engineering friends to discuss the Cedar and Dorotha Channel improvements that are uh, in final design. Bryce Doty will be online to speak to some real estate issues. Um, I will come back and speak to you about the progress of the Killip detention basins and the inlet work that is now underway. Um, and then Sam will spend some time speaking to the siren system that is being developed. And then Sarah will close out the evening with our communications piece. You'll be excited to hear about the website and some of the e-newsletters and the mailings that have gone out to our community. So pretty robust uh, early evening uh, update for you all. And I think you'll find the information is a little bit different than even last month. So a uh, good time for us to meet up with you and get plenty of feedback just prior to plowing that upcoming 18 inches of snow. Okay, Ed, I believe, are you gonna discuss some of these? Yeah, I'll go through these uh, flood cleanup All right. slides. I believe we have two of them. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Ed Shank, Stormwater Manager. Um, so since uh, the beginning of 2022, so just last month, uh, we have some new internal work orders with our two existing water service operators, our WSOs. Um, for cleanup of last year's events. Uh, this includes uh, the Rio de Flag downstream of Spruce Wash, the so downstream of the confluence uh, in the Fox Glen Park area. Uh, the Rio de Flag up in Cheshire, so a different flooding event, but the flood event that happened up in the Fort Valley uh, trail system area, uh, cleaning up that Cheshire Park uh, area. Uh, continued cleaning of Johnson Channels is a small, very small tributary to Spruce Wash in the south side of Sunnyside. Uh, that's actually just uh, finished up. And, and as I mentioned, this is utilizing the, our two existing uh, stormwater operators. Um, in addition to that, we have contract work ongoing in the last month and a half or since the last um, flood update. And that includes a, a new award for work in Fanning Wash at Bushmaster, this is to repair the fence that was just completed and then was wiped out a week later uh, in the flooding. Uh, as well as concrete channel repair, we have a few uh, concrete panels that pulled up near Siler Homes that will need to be re replaced uh, and replacement of two trash racks over an inlet and an outlet uh, that need to be replaced. Um, we also have uh, work spruce wash at Route 66. So this is uh, behind kind of sportsman's area, the blimpies. Uh, we have a foot slow water crossing repair, which is partially funded by a 2019 FEMA grant, and then sediment removal from this, this last year of flooding. And then we have at the moment five small spot improvements for flood repair uh, that has also gone out. So these three different bullet points have been awarded to uh, two of our JOCs, two of our job order contractors, uh, Tiffany Construction, as well as Kinney Construction. Uh, also, uh, with flood cleanup, uh, Parks uh, has been working with facilities and stormwater and in installing a new pump and aerator system at Francis Short Pond. Uh, as you might have remembered, we did have a fish kill this last year, uh, partially due to the fact that our two existing pumps are old uh, that run six aerators. They're also run on solar, and the solar is a little finicky, especially on cloudy days. Uh, so this will be a hardwired pump on the shoreline, uh, so it will run 24-7. Uh, once we have this up and running, we will contact Arizona Game and Fish and have them get back to their regular schedule uh, in terms of fish stocking. And with that, I think I will turn it over to Julie. Good afternoon, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council. Good to see you in person. All right, Scott asked me to take a little bit of time with you this afternoon to talk about the work that we've been doing as far as the feasibility study. 
So the feasibility study is building on the summit. This was the, the two-day statewide workshop that was hosted by a county and city to talk about the really big ideas. And so out of this, the feasibility study, we had these, all these great big ideas. And what we're doing is we're seeing which ones stick um, and maybe which ones don't quite make enough sense or don't make sense at this time. So the purpose of the feasibility study is setting you up for a big project, multi-year project, a big capital program. Um, so one thing that happened when we first started our work, we've had to be a little bit nimble, but you had this opportunity to build the Killip partner with FUSD and install the Killip detention basins. And then there's an opportunity to upsize the Dortha crossing, which are right in the middle of the entire watershed. So what we needed to do is we needed to accelerate the feasibility study of the spruce wash corridor. So of everything that came out of the summit, and many great ideas, the spruce wash corridor is the first is, is the first hit, is the one that makes the most sense for the initial investment, which is maximizing the infrastructure of the Spruce Wash Corridor. Um, so we're looking at capacity. Um, and what I wanna talk about with capacity, this means, um, so our feasibility study of Spruce Wash, we say how big, how, how large of infrastructure can we fit along the Spruce Wash Corridor? What is the maximum capacity that we can fit in that corridor? So what's the flow rate that we can convey through there and still maintain certain things like gravity systems, those critical systems, systems that we can't work around. We have to maintain sewer flows because it's gravity. Um, so how do we work around those gravity systems to maximize that capacity? And also maintain connections to other storm drain infrastructure that's feeding in. So we've got drainage coming off of Fourth, we have drainage coming off of the West Street Wash, and that's all combining in spruce wash at the outlet. So what we have proposed, um, the infrastructure is a concrete box culvert from Route 66 all the way upstream to just past the Linda Vista crossing. That's about 8,300 feet. So that's a little more than a mile and a half of concrete box culvert. And we're talking about box culvert sizes of like 16 by six feet, um, 12 feet by eight feet wide, 12 feet by six feet wide. The sizes vary depending on the constraints and where we are, what the slopes are, all those engineering things. And as we build this out, the capacity that we're seeing is about 1100 CFS or greater. So at the bottom, the flattest and narrowest section, which is First Street and Spruce Avenue, that's, that's our constraint, and that's about that 1100 CFS. And there is an opportunity con to convey a little bit more upstream, but sizing something larger upstream when you have a small straw at the bottom doesn't, doesn't work unless you have an alternative. So one thing I want to point out um, about this, the, the, the proposed infrastructure, one thing that J.E. Fuller's modeling showed us. So if you recall, the, the county is working on a few big projects, um, and one of those is the hydrology updates with J.E. Fuller. And so J.E. Fuller's hydrology and hydraulics. And one thing that they were looking at is, what is the timing for when all of these flows happen, and where do they join? And what we've found is that at the very bottom, right down here, which is first in Route 66, and this is spruce right here. What we found is that West Street Wash hits its peak flow at the same time spruce wash hits its peak flow. And those all join in the same box culvert system that goes under Route 66 to the railroad tracks. So that's our pinch point. And that's gonna be a tricky thing that we're gonna be looking at moving forward because we do have so many constraints at that location. All right, so next steps for us, uh, feasibility study, we're looking to prepare concept plans. So this is plan and profile. This is going to give Ed, the entire water services team, an idea of um, the scope of work for being able to install these concrete box culverts all the way up past Linda Vista Crossing. We're working on an opinion of probable construction costs. 
We're talking with Tiffany Construction, who is um, working on the Dortha crossing for you and doing the sourcing of materials for that um, to support us in that opinion of probable construction costs. We're looking at phasing and sequencing. So how do we start this? You, know, you really need to start at the very downstream end and work your way up. And we need to look at this in segments. And then <laughs> we're, we're, we're still gonna go back to evaluation of alternatives. So some of these other alignments that came out of the summit. We have definitely not forgotten about those. Those are very important. We just really needed to focus on spruce wash first. So this is setting you up for the project starting in the future. Um, so as I said, the feasibility study informed the design of the Dortha Crossing, but it isn't to the level of detail for individual parcel mitigation. So the feasibility study isn't looking at things like flood walls or barriers at specific locations. This is an overall network. This is the, that long haul effort that you know, will ease the flooding pain for Sunnyside and Grandview on, on a community-wide level. And that's the direction we're going in the focus of the feasibility study. So I am happy to answer questions. I know that was a lot of information. Thank you. Uh, Council, do we have any questions at this time? Mayor, I do have a question. Yeah, Council Member Shimoni and then uh, Vice Mayor just put a cue in the chat. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Julie, and everyone that's presenting tonight. I uh, appreciate you being here and your work. Julie, quick question. So you said that pinch point at the bottom, uh, that's really the, the straw that we're concerned about. Just curious, so is plan B basically, you know, assuming that it's going to overflow at some point, is it just going to basically spill over onto 66? So at that point, um, you would see it back up in the system further up in the system. Um, so it wouldn't necessarily spill over at that point. The modeling would likely show it, like all of a sudden, you wouldn't have capacity to intercept runoff upstream or conveyance. It just wouldn't go into those catch basins or would just bypass it. So you'd see that further upstream. Okay, great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, uh, Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you so much, Julie. Wait a minute, where's my, okay, there we go. Um, couple questions. The, the uh, modeling, the fuller modeling that you um, referenced, is that available to the public or will it be available to the public? Vice Mayor Daggett, I understand that the updated maps will be available to the public, and I do not know the timing of that, but uh, Christopher Tressler, who I think is on tonight, might be able to provide more information on that. Yes, thank you, Julie. So we are working through the process. We're actually going door-to-door uh, -door meeting with people now and we'll make uh, more documents available to the general public as soon as we've had a chance to meet with people one-on-one, -on -one, and then we'll, then we'll uh, be in earnest with our, our public-wide uh, meetings and sharing. And we just, uh, we feel it's important to have, to let the landowners that are gonna be impacted understand and hear it from the, the engineers and the technical people first, and then share it with the public at large. Okay, thank you. And, um, Julie, same goes with the feasibility study. Is um, that going to be released to the public? Uh, Vice Mayor Daggett, that is something that has been finalized and submitted to city staff and I believe is public record. So how it is released would be up to uh, city staff. Thank you. And so city staff, um, do we have a plan for releasing that to the public? Well, thank you, Vice Mayor. Thank you, Julie. Um, we have not discussed internally as a city staff how that will be disseminated. I do want to uh, make sure we check in with risk and with legal. Just to go through the document, it is fairly technical in nature, and we want to make certain that we're um, meeting all the marks that they would require um, to not only release good, transparent information, but to protect interests of the city. So I'm not trying to dodge your question, but um, we have not asked that question, but I will follow up on it 
and uh, we will make certain that we're as transparent as possible and legally allowed. Okay, um, so matter of weeks, you think, months? Again, I'm unsure on timeline. Uh, St Sterling, did you want to chime in at all, or, or my? I don't want to put you on the spot, so I apologize. I can certainly follow up if we don't have an accurate answer. Sure, I'm happy to chime in. I appreciate it, uh, uh, Mayor and Council. Obviously, we would like to make that happen within uh, weeks, if possible. Um, I, I can't guarantee that, but that said, it is at the forefront and on the, uh, you know, the very. Uh, top of our priority list. Great, thank you. And then Julie, the the pinch point at 66, you said that um, it's likely the water will back up. Do you know how far upstream um, it's likely to back up? Uh, Vice Mayor Daggett, no. Um, that's a pretty complex hydraulic model. And, you know, it depends, of course, on the storm event, what you're running through. Um, you know, one thing that uh, Council Member Shimoni reminded me of, you know, in, in that context is the more opportunities we can provide for detention upstream. So this mm -hmm. is the Killip Detention Basin, for example. That's going to help with that. That modeling is not complete yet. Okay. In that system to be able to, the, the modeling that says, okay, Killet Basin is online and we're going to route flows through there, that modeling is not complete. Okay. Thank so, you very yep. much. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. You, Vice Mayor, any other uh, questions before we move forward? Uh, Councilman Rasslin. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Julie and Scott. Uh, I do have a, some just general questions conceptually about the Killet Basin. Um, now, when that's not being used to retain water, it's going to be park space, right? It's going to be available for the students of Killip Elementary or the public. And then sort of my other follow-up to that is, what do your models show in terms of how long it takes for that water in the retention basin to drain away or to evaporate? Yes, so uh, if you recall, the FUSD uh, IGA that we have entered into to deliver the detention basins um, adjacent to Killip School allows us the capacity to contain, in essence, about 11 acre feet of water. And that water will slowly dissipate from that system in a more reasonable fashion into our existing infrastructure on Third Street, um, which is all underground. The actual playing surface will be as designed, uh, you know, a field at the bottom of these detention basins with a safer slope to get to those locations. There's a baseball field or a softball field on the southern basin, and then there's a multi-purpose field scheduled for the upper basin. Uh, both of those will be seeded at this time um, as an agreement with FUSD so that it is somewhat attractive, somewhat usable, but we've also been very candid that until we can see the effects of all upstream mitigation measures and the impacts of post-fire uh, flooding. We know that maybe, for example, putting down artificial turf or a really expensive amenity doesn't make a lot of sense at this time. And we're generally all in agreement that we've got to let it kind of run its course until we come to some stabilization of the entire wash before we really invest a lot of money into a formal field structure. But it is important too, though, that the school and the community have usable playing fields once the basins are built. So I think we've struck what I would consider kind of the middle option, um, but we also are gonna be heartbroken when we fill them up with sediment and we have to go clean them out, but that is something we're prepared to do. And uh, obviously this is context dependent, uh, but what, what is the flow rate of how that area will drain? Uh, you know, if, if we get a big storm and there's a lot of volume in there, obviously it's gonna take longer before the kids can use those fields again. Uh, smaller events, it will take less time, but do you have a general sense of the, the rate? Yeah, Councilmember Aslan, um, city code requires that all basins drain in 36 hours. So it will be designed so to drain a, within a 36 hours. Okay, um, I was wondering if it was gonna be a week or two sometimes, but not really. No, and really the purpose of that is um, to prevent waterborne disease. And we need to pr be particularly sensitive about that with um, being next to a school. Mm -hmm. 
thank you for those questions, Councilmember Aslan. Um, I think we are ready to proceed. I did want to provide one more bit of clarification to the point Julie was making, and it was requested that we follow up. If we could just spend one more minute or so on connecting the feasibility study to the midterm mitigations that are now currently either being planned in the near term or are under construction. So for example, Julie, we have the Killip Basins, we have the Dorotha Channel improvements and the crossing coming up quickly. You had mentioned briefly in your comments that the feasibility study was almost advanced to discuss and look at those items. Could you provide us a little more depth of how the feasibility study relates to the field project, Dorotha Crossing, and the Dorotha improvements um, within the feasibility study and what relationship they hold to the box culvert structure that is designed from 66 all the way to Linda Vista. But I think specifically, how do the projects relate to the feasibility study? Good? Good. All right. <laughs> Hope I got it right. <laughs> Mayor, Council, thank you, Scott. So when the, when the Dortha crossing was initially discussed, um, they were looking at some other constraints in that area. We accelerated the feasibility study to inform the size of that box culvert. The size of that box culvert at Dortha is now a 12 foot by eight foot box, which is the largest size we can fit under Dortha with the existing um, elevations through there. Um, we've been coordinating with SWI um, the design engineer for the Dortha Crossing about what are the elevations that we need to connect to and what do they need to connect to, setting this up and thinking about the future. Then we've been also coordinating with SWI on what's the elevation of the Killip detention basins? What's the bottom elevation? What's the top elevation? And what slopes do we need to hold and control through spruce wash between the Dortha Crossing and Killip to make sure that all of those pieces can connect together in the future. So we meet weekly to talk about these technical details. Um, we review each other's documents and plans. Um, we share CAD files and that's all so that we can, as you look to the future as this capital program, you're putting the Legos in piece by piece, but the Legos you already have in can stay. Does that answer your question, Scott? I, I think so. I, th I think it does relate back to the project work that's underway and to how it was integrated into the feasibility study and why it justified not only the acceleration of those projects, but I think there's a lot of visibility on the Dortha project. You're hearing from citizens and residents, same with the Killip project. And I think it's really important that um, for you to be able to explain to a resident why those projects have been evaluated the way they have, how they fit within the feasibility study, that really some of the questions have become, it's not even really done. Well, we kind of advanced some of that analysis so we would feel good about that and um, be able to deliver the project on a schedule that didn't match our final feasibility study. So hopefully that helps you all um, with some talking points as well, in particular with residents. Christopher, thank you, Julie. Christopher, I'm coming to you next. I have one comment by Gary Miller, and then uh, you'll be up with the um, update on Parkway sediment basins. I do have a uh, hand raised by Council Member Shimoni, if you'd like to oh. jump in here. Yep. Thank you. Should I, should I leave my hand up? Just kidding. Um, uh, yes, Scott. <laughs> Scott, along those lines of communication and explanation to the public, and I know Sarah is yet to speak, but uh, it'd be great to, to create a video that was multilingual that explains that so that it makes our lives as council members easier just to say, hey, check out this really yeah. fun two-minute video that really breaks it down in a very nice way. Uh, we'll let Sarah address that later, but I just wanted to plant that seed while I had the opportunity. Thank you. I, say, I don't want to steal our thunder, so we'll wait for Sarah, and then we'll make sure we follow up on that one. Right there. Yeah, thank you. All right, thanks, Scott. Um, this is Gary Miller with Water Services. I wanted to give a quick update on something that Julie touched on and, and uh, I think something that you have received some inquiries or questions about and that's related to flood walls. Um, flood walls are 
a, an individual property owner mitigation measure that the city's been exploring for a while. Um, it's not part of the larger effort that Julie's doing with the uh, feasibility study because it's not a city infrastructure improvement that the city would lead. Um, these flood walls basically, basically the effort the city's putting forward with these flood walls is um, preparing a tool that property owners can use to do individual mitigation at their homes. Um, and what we've done thus far is prepare a, a how-to document, how to submit a permit. Um, we've prepared some floodgate details that can be submitted with that permit application so that property owners can construct floodgates. And we're in the process of preparing uh, a flood wall detail as well. Um, I've been working really closely with a property owner in the Grandview neighborhood who got a grant from sustainability to get some design work done for flood walls. And we're moving forward with that. Uh, this week, I'm trying to get some geotech work done or at least initiate that contract so that the, the structural engineer has some information to um, move that flood wall detail design forward. And that's what I have on flood walls. So I'm, unless there's any questions, I'm gonna turn it over to Christopher and we'll go from there. Thank you. I'm not seeing any questions at this time. So Christopher, take it away. Thank you, Mayor. So the update on the basins upstream of Linda Vista is that work continues with the Army Corps of Engineers. And we've really um, begun in earnest meeting with residents one on one. Um, the unique part of this project this time is that there is uh, potential jurisdictional waters, uh, waters of the US. And so that's a significant process and that's begun in earnest meeting with residents and, uh, and working through that permitting process. There's also the work that Lucinda talked about uh, the last update related to SHPO or the State Historic Preservation Office. And we are, um, there's a public comment period that'll happen. There's, uh, there's been an announcement uh, that's gone out that announces a, a public meeting and uh, it's all related to the Beale Wagon Road that goes through the area, or at least a portion of it. And so work continues uh, with these permitting and regulatory parts of it. The design continues to, uh, to be refined and reviewed. And we're uh, working with utility companies to look at uh, utility conflicts and also working with City of Flagstaff um, right away and easement uh, people to uh, understand how we can move forward uh, converting parts of the, the easements that are currently held uh, to appropriately reflect the type of easement that may be needed for these basins. And so we're still working. Uh, it's quite a large effort here and we are optimistic, but as Lucinda mentioned before, that it's likely this project may push into the next uh, construction season uh, but we're, we're uh, crossing our fingers and we'll see where uh, we get. Thank you, Christopher. And I, I wish my dad, I appreciate the leadership on this one. This one's a very, a very technical project with a lot of intricacies and the design consultants have been experts at the table, but um, the county efforts have not gone unnoticed and um, we've appreciated the assistance trying to get this one delivered very close to our adjacent infrastructure. And uh, it's been going fairly smooth considering the complexities. Thank you. Again for joining uh, Vice us. Mayor has a question here. Thank you, Mayor, and um, thank you, Christopher and Scott. So, first of all, forgive me if I'm asking a question that seems really elementary to you. Um, so, so. Um, Residents are held to a no adverse impact um, for anything they do on their property. Is our, our city and county projects, when you do the modeling, um, that's one of the elements that you're looking for too, correct? That, that, that whatever we're doing has no adverse impacts downstream. Uh, exactly, and, and we are, the, the way we go about this adverse impact analysis 
is we actually pull a third party in to conduct that analysis so that in a sense, they didn't have any stake in the design and they didn't have any stake in the construction. And, uh, and they are a third party that reviews the design. They run an analysis and they identify uh, where um, or in, if there have been any um, increases in water surface elevation or increases in velocity as a result of the project. And so that is uh, an analysis and that both the city and the county uh, are held to uh, just like we would expect residents to do. And uh, we take it very serious. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, oh, and um, I, I, and I'm, I'm guessing that this is part of your, mo your modeling. So the, the projects that are upstream of Grandview I might be asking a question that's already been answered, but but let me, this might be for Julie and for Christopher. So upstream projects, um, upstream of Grandview, that those are included in the modeling so that we have a sense of how those projects help the residents that are directly underneath the Linda Vista, and by underneath, I mean, you know, downstream of the Linda Vista culvert. Right. Yeah, right. So you might be asking a question related to uh, all the flood mitigation measures that are in place. Has it been modeled and uh, and do we know truly the impact of that? And we, we have not modeled all of the sandbags and all of the concrete barriers that have been put in place. A lot of this mitigation work is uh, was emergency and, uh, and been uh, placed, but as we move forward and uh, as we design these more uh, longer term or um, more robust uh, flood mitigation measures, then we do take into account uh, the significant infrastructure that's in place that, uh, that could be altering uh, flow and could be adversely impacting people. There's a, a really good project that was carried out at the top of uh, Paradise where at the end of the monsoon season last year at, uh, that widened the channel. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so that work will definitely be taken into account as we model and understand uh, what the what the flow of water is and, and how it uh, may be altered uh, with these flood mitigation projects. Thank you. And, and that's, those are the projects that I'm talking about that I'm referring to are the ones that you have in the works um, rather than the emergency um, measures that were taken last summer. So thank you. That That's all of my questions for now. And Vice Mayor, I might add, while it's not intended to be a leading question, please keep in mind that we are also designing to a, a design standard and the engineering teams have all been working towards that as that number Julie shared was kind of that 1100 CFS number. We, we do want to be sincere and and let you know that we will not be able to probably design our way out of all storm events. So, you know, if we had all the land availability and we had all of the finance available to try to mitigate to the, the largest storm imaginable, um, that is not what's likely going to happen here. So I, I, I want to be cautious and, and a little bit guarded knowing that we're optimistic that these are going to handle majority of the storms and we're going to do really good work, but, um, you know, never will we likely be able to tell a resident that we are completely out of harm's way. And there will be large storm events where even the more improved robust system will likely be overwhelmed. So it is worth noting that um, no matter how much engineering we can kind of do here, it won't be the end all for all residents throughout the wash. Thank you, Scott. I, I, um, I appreciate that. And I have heard you all say that several times, and I think it bears repeating, uh, you know, every time we get a presentation that, um, that we're working under certain constraints. Um, and so I just want to acknowledge that. Thank you. No, thank you. I appreciate it. They've, we, we've all trained each other well. We're all starting to speak the same language. So that's a good thing. Thank you, Christopher.
Yes, thank you all. Um, I think we are ready to proceed. I'm not seeing any further C's and Q's from Council. Thank you. And next up will be Christine Cameron to give us an update on the Cedar to Dorotha Channel Improvement Project. Great. Thank you, Scott. Um, Mayor, Vice Mayor and Council, I'm Christine Cameron, Project Manager with Capital Improvements. So our, our project scope, uh, the city is constructing channel improvements from Cedar Avenue down to Dortha in the Spruce Wash. Uh, this is the area between Main Street and Rose in Sunnyside. Uh, the channel is currently cutting into people's properties, undermining fences, and uh, has been scoured out uh, last summer with the flooding. Uh, we'll be regrading and lining the channel with shotcrete, which is a, a concrete material, and a grouted riprap, which are large cobbles. And this will provide stabilization uh, to that channel area. Uh, the crossing at Dortha will also be reconstructed. Uh, the crossing, which is the inlet, is currently a 60-inch pipe, and this will be upsized, as Julie said, to a 12 by 8 concrete box. And this is about 120 feet in length for this box, um, so it will pass a lot more water. Uh, we're looking at doubling the capacity from uh, a current 600 CFS um, to 1,100 with this phase. And when, when the future improvements are made uh, to the south of Dortha and in, in uh, the future phases of the spruce wash improvements um, and that pipe is enlarged, we'll see closer to 1,400 CFS. Uh, our project budget is currently $2 million. Um, the contractor is working up his cost. And so um, in March, I'll be back and we can probably talk a little bit more about how we're, we're lining up with our, our project budget. And for the schedule, uh, our goal is to have the project completed prior to monsoons. This year, um, the contractor is coordinating with Unisource now and lining up their work with construction since the excavations will cover both the gas main relocation and the large box construction. Uh, we hope to see work start by April. Um, and, and again, I'll have a better idea of our, our project schedule when we come back for our update in March. Um, we are starting at the Dortha Crossing first and working our way north. Uh, so the large inlet structure, which is the most critical for capacity increase, will be the first item that we build uh, to get that completed. And our, our current activities, um, we, we have a pre-construction phase job order contract with, with Tiffany Construction, our contractor, and this will have a construction phase added to it, which is being cost out now. Um, I mentioned the utility relocation uh, coordination and, and the other item we've been busy with is the property acquisition for the channel improvements. So there is a, a public utility easement that was platted with the neighborhood, uh, but it doesn't cover construction of the drainage structure. So we are getting an easement to cover our work from, from the property owners. Uh, appraiser, appraisals are being done now, and uh, we've been working with the individual property owners to get early rights of entry so we don't have to wait on the entire acquisition process to close out uh, before we, we start work. So that's my slide and Scott, I'll, I'll take questions or turn it back over to you. Excellent, thank you. I'm not seeing any questions at this time. So uh, yeah, Scott, please proceed. Thank you, Christine. I know you and Bryce have spent a fair amount of time with residents as well in that area. And that's obviously meaningful and it's starting to make a lot of sense as the construction plans get underway. So. Good work on that one. Next, we have the um, Killip Detention Basin project. Um, you saw me a lot during the IGA process. Um, I believe Adam Yali is with us from Public Works, uh, our engineering staff this evening. Um, and while I kind of failed to mention to him that there was a formal update this evening, um, I'm sure he'd be well versed and prepared to speak to construction activity um, as soon as he uh, chimes in with us. But Generally, the project is going well. Um, if you've been by Killip School, you'll see that the uh, large basins are being excavated at this time. Oh, got a thumbs up from Mayor Deasy. Um, they still are storing materials on those sites and they're processing some material, but we also have the underground 60 inch pipe you see in the image on the right. That is the pipe that'll connect to the third street existing infrastructure. It'll go right under the driveway of the new elementary school. And uh, this project is going very well. Adam, do you have anything to add or anything you would like to note of this project? Absolutely. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor Council. Um, Scott, thank you for the uh, pitch. I appreciate that. Yes, construction activities moving very quickly. The 60 inch 
um, plastic pipe as we see in the picture here uh, on the right. Uh, for the most part, that whole alignment is in. They have connected it to the existing 60 inch concrete uh, pipe. And that's located right there at third and sixth. And that connection has been made. Um, the pipe that leads to the baseball field is in place. They're just finishing up some, some backfilling. They had to relocate some water lines. And then on the main fields, the contractor is still working on the excavation of that uh, material. They did find a, a dense consolidated layer, a, a rock-like layer, if you will. And we're working with them on that, on, on the processing. They were out working today, as a matter of fact. And um, not to steal Sarah's uh, thunder, but we did take some video, uh, Council Member Shimoni. Uh, so that will be posted up there as well, I would assume. But uh, yes, the project is moving along very, very, very quickly. And I'm here for any questions. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll just say I, I go by that location several times a week, and I am just really impressed with the progress um, the team's been able to make. So thank you so much for uh, all the work on this section um, in particular. It's People are noticing it, and I certainly do as well. So uh, I'm not seeing any other C's and Q's in the comment box. So um, yeah, please proceed. Thank you. And Adam, we appreciate your leadership on that project. And uh, as soon as you wrap that one up, we'll get you the next one. So good work keeping Understood. that in line. And um, he did show his hand a little bit. We are running into some more dense material. I don't like to call it rock, but we do have some material we're going to deal with. Um, and Adam's coming up with some really good creative solutions to try to manage that one as best as possible as it was an unknown. So uh, we'll be to you in the future if that becomes a bigger issue. Um, but right now we're hoping we can manage that a little bit. Moving to the structure that is now being called the Killip Inlet at Ponderosa Park. This would be the structure that will be built adjacent to these facilities, just to the north in the actual Ponderosa Park that the city owns. If you recall, we built a, a slip or an exit lane for overflow uh, waters to move where they were already headed. We just kind of helped them get there so they would not impact Arroyo Seco quite as badly. Um, we've moved, used Ponderosa Park for this conveyance exercise. And unfortunately, it's done a number on our own city park. Um, better than homes, but at the same time, we knew we needed to probably think about what the design looks like to move the water from the top of Arroyo Seco into these detention basins. We have shifted some of our engineering efforts and some of our teams uh, to start to solve this problem and to start come up with mitigation efforts that make a lot of sense. We have been working with parks uh, to start thinking about different integrated elements. Um, we want to make sure that if we can build a Hagen half pipe, that's exactly what we do in a park that needs a lot of attention and a lot of improvement. So we're hoping, if possible, we may be able to get some uh, park amenity while building a conveyance amenity into the detention basin from top of Royal Seco. Uh, remember, our primary conveyance will be the primary reason and rationale. Um, but we really would like to continue that discussion with parks and the community about how we can improve that um, with some sort of am amenity. So um, we'll be back to you with more information about this project. Uh, we think it's likely in the next couple months to be in more of its final design state. Um, at this juncture, it's, it's really preliminary and we're just continuing to work these problems as we move through the uh, wash. Sam, I believe you are up with the next item to discuss our uh, upcoming siren system. You, uh, real quick, uh, Scott. Um, so you're saying that there's a potential we're, we're gonna be able to put in a half pipe of a skate park or something to that effect in that area? So I always say something like that and then I get myself caught. So we, we, we affectionately recall, uh, refer to this item as the Hagen half pipe in reference to Amy Hagen, our parks director. Um, she has been very instrumental in working with us to try to come up with some different ways. Um, and, and her team with Rebecca have been in discussions with us is how can we come up with a creative park amenity when it is not a flood conveyance? So we've thrown out some ideas and we're pushing these engineers to come up with some solutions and some ideas that might make sense. Um, and the Hagen half pipe continues to come to the top of the list um, as a cool amenity. Um, 
not quite sure what it's going to look like, but we, we think we can get there. That's awesome. That, that's a really great idea. And I just want to say that we'll, we'll need to continue to call it the Hagen half pipe. Right. If that's what uh, we, we put in there. I think that's awesome. So thank you. <laughs> we made her clean up enough mud out of that park this summer that it's the least we can yep. probably do. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Scott. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor and Council. I uh, appreciate the time here. So uh, good news is we uh, had some time here this afternoon or this morning. We spent two hours on uh, the beautiful sunny morning walking through the field, ground truthing our hard locations for the siren system to ensure that we're picking the, uh, the locations that maximize the output of these sirens. Uh, so we had representatives from the vendor, APS, uh, I'd like to thank Rick Miller, David Millis, uh, Blake Burner. They've really been key and instrumental uh, as Team Flagstaff here really pushes to try and get this uh, implemented within the city and with the county's uh, efforts really just bringing that home. So a lot of good moving pieces here. Uh, we did identify a couple shifts in the uh, locations one and two, if we call them that. And uh, as we're waiting for the siren vendor to come back and remap these sirens, and uh, so we have a better understanding of what their output will be and what kind of coverage we'll get. Uh, we'll be working on the back end to make sure that everything's in place, that there's no hiccups. Um, other than that, everything's moving really well on the siren system thus far, and we hope that that just continues moving down the, down the pipe here. With this, really the only update was today's walkthrough. Uh, with that, I can take any questions. I'd be happy to take. Thank you. Councilmember Shimoni has a question. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Sam. Good to see you in person. Uh, Sam, quick question in regards to the community's response to the siren system. Have you heard any feedback? You know, I haven't. Um, as far as negative, positive, I just haven't heard anything. I wish I have heard more, but um, unless anything's come through, I'll let Sarah answer that question. But for me, I have not. Councilmember Shimoni, thank you for the question. Um, I also haven't heard any feedback about specific plans that Sam is implementing, but I would say that this was a highly requested item um, last year in moving out of monsoon season. This was something residents talked about very frequently um, as being very needed. So that's a bit of feedback that we got um, prior to Sam's work. Thanks. Right, absolutely. And I, I too see tremendous value in this and assume the community will as well. I was just curious if, if you had heard anything, but thank you, I appreciate that update. Thank you, Council Member Shimoni. I will mention that I have heard from um, several residents as well, very positive uh, feedback for this option. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, no negative as well. So this is uh, really excited about this add on to the project. Well, unless there's anything else, uh, I appreciate the time. And again, I think any uh, public information is good information, whether it's an alerting system or all the hard work Sarah does. So uh, we look forward to moving forward. Thank you all. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna switch uh, the topic a little bit. We're gonna to go to South Mount Eldon updates. Uh, this is uh, updates related to the flooding in the Appalachian and Shadow Mountain neighborhoods uh, this last summer. Uh, so we have modeled a uh, new channel incision and flood risk. This is based on J.E. Fuller uh, models from both the 2021 LIDAR that was flown in November and also that 2019 LIDAR that was flown directly after the museum fire. Um, with that, we're using that to inform uh, new designs for detention basin and channel diversion structure uh, upstream of the city. Uh, this design is being done by Woodson Engineering with J.E. Fuller as well. And we have ongoing discussions with the property owner, Kinder Morgan Natural Gas, uh, for potential property acquisitions for that detention basin. Uh, I have here a bullet point. Funding for the actual construction, not for the design. Uh, funding for the construction will likely be either through that stormwater bond election, which is coming up, uh, or hopefully uh, a FEMA brick grant, which is a building resilient infrastructures and community. Uh, those grants are extremely competitive, so the likelihood of getting that is, um, well, unsure, but we'll be working through that. Uh, and that's all I have for South Mount Elton at the moment. If there's any questions, uh, let me know. Thank you, uh, Council Member Shimoni. 
Thank you. Of course, I have another question. <laughs> so how does this moving forward impact the other plans? Can you just talk about the con connectivity between this and, and everything else we're talking about a little bit? Sure. So the, the biggest connectivity really between the two um, is one, both the design process, because we are kind of piggybacking off of the model and a LIDAR um, acquisition that we had for Spruce Wash. So this is actually fairly opportunistic that we can do this modeling and design work now. Uh, but then also that channel diversion structure, so one of the two projects that's listed, is a tributary to uh, Spruce Wash. So if we can get that diversion structure in, we will be able to move water out of the Appalachian neighborhood and into those parkway basins without bringing extra sediment into those basins. So it actually will be an improvement or can be an improvement, hasn't been modeled yet, can be an improvement in terms of sediment delivery to the basins, so less maintenance uh, for cleaning out those basins as we go forward. Thank you. Uh, Vice. Uh, Vice Mayor Daggett has a question. Thank you. Um, can you remind me what LIDAR is? Yeah, light detection and ranging, <laughs> which is a, a long word for saying uh, you fly a plane over an area and then you're shooting a laser down at the, at the ground. And with that laser, it's somewhat similar to radar, except radar is a little different. But with that laser, you're getting very precise and potentially accurate uh, measurements of elevation. So uh, this last run was run by the county with support by the city uh, for this feasibility study and for the modeling and spruce wash. Uh, the benefit of it beyond that is that we can use it for other areas of the city where the LIDAR has been acquired. Um, so it gives us a, a very accurate and precise measurement of elevation. And when we do that multiple times, we can also do change detection using GIS or other models. So that kind of, that weird picture you see on the side of the slide, that is actually um, a cut fill model in GIS. So the yellow and red, that's areas that where we had erosion it's between 2019 and 2021. Uh, the actual area is the south side of Mount Eldon. And then the green is areas where we saw aggradation. So areas where we saw uh, sediment be deposited in an area. Thank you. And then just to make sure that I understand this project, we're talking about, um, I know that the Kinder uh, Morgan natural gas line runs behind Appalachian, Appalachian, um, and, and that's where we're talking about this project being, correct? Correct. So there's two areas behind Appalachian or Appalachian, however you want to pronounce it. Uh, and one area is roughly a six acre undeveloped uh, parcel that Kinder Morgan owns. Uh, and that is a, a good location to put a detention basin. So we can slow the flow, let it drop out any sediment, and then kind of slowly drop that back into the Shadow Mountain neighborhood and allow the road to convey the water to, to the stormwater system. And then we have another section along the Kinder Morgan pipeline. It's actually Forest Service owned. Uh, directly west of there that would be diverting water from one tributary into another that has more capacity and then putting that water into those parkway basins that we're talking about earlier in this in this presentation. So essentially cutting it out from the cul-de-sac at the end of Appalachian where there's quite a bit of damage done this year um, as well as 2003 and 2014 and putting that water into the parkway basins. Great. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Okay, so if there are no other questions, I can move on to Sarah. Yeah, we are uh, good to proceed. Thank you much. All right, good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Uh, Sarah Langley, Public Affairs Director. I have the last slide of the evening for you tonight. Um, some notable uh, communications outputs to report to you. We have launched our project website, which is museumfloodprojects.com on February 7th, so a few uh, weeks ago now. The project, or sorry, the website has information on all of our different projects that were discussed tonight. Um, it also features a page where everything is translated into Spanish. Um, it has a page where you can view all of the past city council meetings that we've had, or sorry, agenda items that we've had on uh, museum flood updates all in one spot. 
And it also has a page where you can kind of stay informed um, and sign up for our e-newsletters, sign up for emergency alerts, uh, other things like that. As of Monday, so yesterday, we had about 750 page views on our website. So it looks like the community is, is getting to know the website and using that as a resource. Uh, in addition to the website, we mailed out our first physical uh, project flyer last Wednesday. That went out in both uh, Spanish and English to all city residents in the impacted area. Um, we followed that up with an e-newsletter, which is basically the same content as the flyer, but to everyone in our email distribution list, which is over 450 email addresses, uh, just to make sure that everyone is receiving that information. Um, and again, that flyer is just highlighting our ongoing projects and, and driving people to our website where they can find more um, in-depth information. That um, mailer that went out is in your agenda packet. And I also have some extra printed copies up in the office if you would like some for any, any reason. Um, looking forward, we are already working on the content for our next e-newsletter, which we're hoping to get out in several weeks. Um, that could feature project updates. It could also feature some frequently asked questions that we've received from residents. Um, so just kind of, uh, we'll see what information is ready to communicate at that time and, and get it out to the community. Um, also looking forward, Samantha Victor, our community engagement specialist, is working on a short video focused on the Killip detention basins and thanks to Adam um, with Public Works for his help and, and setting Samantha up on that. Um, we're also hoping to put together a short video about the siren system installation once that gets started. Um, we thought that would be some great uh, visuals for our residents to see. So that's a bit of a recap of what we've done and what we have in the works. Uh, happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah and team. Um, we do have one public comment that I would like to take and then we can um, circle back to questions or comments from council. So we're, we're all lined up. happy to have uh, yeah the public comment. Mayor and Council, I have Don Rodriguez. Don, you may go ahead and address Mayor and Council. Sorry about that. Can everybody hear me now? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, I lost my spot here. Sunnyside has always been abandoned, and instead of quitting, we find legally researched solutions that are never at the expense of our neighbors. Rather, our neighbors benefit without having to contribute. Our walls were built as privacy fences because of the trauma of cops killing a kid down the street, all the drive-by shooting, and a scared cop driving into our driveway and pulling a shaking gun on me while I was carrying my newborn baby. These are our constraints. In 2006, road engineers said it was our responsibility to build brick walls on the southern property line east to west to push the water faster into the alley. This made sense because that's what was done by Chris's Double D Tire and Dortha Inlet is following these same guidelines this year. This is also why the city is currently promoting and approving grants to help residents build walls. Julie said it's a community-wide effort except that all major Northern Arizona engineers are involved in this project and my proposal is that the leaders of each organization get on the same page and then share their findings to help the community. If there is conflicting information, it needs to be handled right away in a formal matter, manner, and this should be coordinated with all the parties involved. We followed the how-to documents that was mentioned earlier in the meeting. The city needs to stand by the info they put out in those documents as well. Currently, this might be difficult because the city of Flagstaff refuses to answer even simple questions in the Q&A newsletter, such as how many cubic feet per second can the Dortha Inlet handle? But on the other side of that, I would like to say that I am seeing a lot of progress, progress and I feel really confident going into the summer that people are listening and the question about the sirens, I know that's gonna help the community. Of course, there's always questions and improvements that can be made. And I know we, we got the text alerts and I also know a lot of people were walking in the streets and when I stopped them and told them to find shelter, they didn't know what was happening. So I know that siren's gonna help, but um, during the flooding, the text alerts, 
Um, they came really close to when the flood actually hit, and I realize there's gauges and everything, um, but I don't know if that could improve. Um, you know, the, the time, you, you get more than a couple minutes, um, just to throw that out there. And thank you to everybody that's been really positive and working together, and, and um, everybody's trying to get on the same page and uh, communicate with residents and we we really appreciate it i guess at this point just stand by the information now that's being put out um would be the next step thank you thank you donna and i really appreciate your advocacy and i just it's so important for us to know also what's going on on the ground through all this process um very very important and uh, i'm grateful for your commentary uh, Councilmember Shon Shimoni does have a question for you. Thank you, Mayor. And Don, thank you again for your ongoing advocacy and communication with us uh, through this process. We really appreciate that. Don, just wondering, you know, we just had a, a pretty amazing update from our staff and our team, and I'm very impressed with the efforts that are being outlined here. I'm just curious if, you know, I, I hear some questions from you. I see a thumbs up, but I'd love to pass you the mic, Don, and, and let you speak, you know, and, and my question to you is, you know, although we might not have all the details worked out yet, and I hear your question about the, the Dortha Inlet and the CP, CFS, but do you feel like we're on a good track? I feel like we're moving along better than I ever thought we would, but there's still a ways to go, but it's just, you know, we had to go to City Hall today, and I know my first experience going to City Hall was a nightmare, and Today it was a 180, and I just feel like thank you everybody for listening and taking everything to heart. And it just, I'm just so proud of everybody, and I hope that we could just keep this momentum going. Thank you for the question, sir. Don, I'm so glad to hear you say that, and that's going to help me rest tonight. <laughs> so glad to hear that we're doing something that is is good, not only by our standards but yours as well. So thank you, and, and please do continue to engage. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilmember Shimoni. I'll just say, Don, that you are a big part of keeping this momentum going. Um, so thank you for your continued contribution and making sure that uh, we remain on that trajectory. Um, is, is there any other public comment before we move forward? Mayor, that was our only one. Okay, thank you, Ms. Fobar. Uh, with that, uh, Council, happy to open up to comments, questions, uh, anything else. Uh, Councilmember Shimoni. Gosh, I feel bad. Uh, I guess I'll just go ahead since I have the mic. I see Vice Mayor has a question as well. So I have a question for Sarah, and I have a question, I think, for Julie. Um, I'll start with Sarah, the easy one. <laughs> um, Sarah, uh, I love what you're doing. I think you're doing a great job. The website's incredible. I've heard nothing but positive feedback. Uh, my only addition, additional question to ask is, is it possible to maybe create a, a video that specifically talks about what Julie had presented on and that bigger picture plan of, of those projects and that Scott spoke to in regards to having council best advocate for the reasoning and the timeline? Uh, do you know what, what I'm talking about specifically? What, what do you think? Yeah, thank you, Councilmember Shimoni, for the question. I think that's definitely something we could put together, um, maybe steal a few minutes of Julie and, and Scott's time. Um, I think it would be useful to just let people know how that project intersects with um, everything else that we're doing. So, yep, that's definitely something we can keep on our radar. Um, we also discussed internally doing a newsletter about the um, initial findings of the feasibility study. Of course, you know, internally, we're still kind of digesting that information and, um, We'll, but yeah, we will definitely be communicating out about that in the future. Thanks. And just Sarah, while I have you all to say, I think the flyers look great. I love, I love the visuals. I love the colors. I like that it has a QR code. I love that it's translated. Mm -hmm. This is really exciting stuff. And, and I know you've worked hard on this. So thank you for your work. Great. Thank you very much. And my second, second question for Julie. Um, Julie, in regards to the modeling, I guess I'm just wondering holistically thinking about year one versus year two versus year three, five, year 10, year 20. Is there anything that the model is telling us in regards to what peak flow looks like and where it kind of like levels out and starts going downhill in regards to the date, like the amount, the volume? I know there's a lot of moving factors, but I'm just wondering at what point is our infrastructure really gonna have our, our you know, at what point do we have too much 
infrastructure? Is that 20 years out? Is that 10 years out? Uh, at what point is the infrastructure going to be able to handle whatever is thrown at us? And, I, and in the back of my head, Scott, I'm hearing your voice saying Mother Nature always wins. And I know that's the big X factor, too, is what is Mother Nature going to throw at us. But uh, do you have any thoughts on that that you can share with us in regards to the modeling? Um, Council Member Shimoni, I think what you're asking about is when is the watershed recovered? Essentially, when is the watershed recovered such that we are at pre-fire flows off of the watershed? Not necessarily pre-wildfire, but, necess but significantly less. Mm -hmm. And I think what I would, um, you know, I might ask uh, Christopher Tressler to weigh, on this, uh, weigh in on this as well if he's still joining us. But um, we've had some interesting information. We had um, some folks from University of Arizona present to us. Ed, you want to speak to that? Okay. Uh, we had some folks from University of Arizona present to us about the recovery that they have seen in the past couple years since the museum flood and what that looks like because they are going up and they are, they are looking at ground cover, they're looking at soil conditions to see how that might change and how quickly that's changing. Um, I think Ed wants to come on up. Yeah, I, I can jump in and maybe Christopher can as well. Um, that's a great question. And it's not one we can easily answer. Um, if you went up in the watershed right after the fire, for, so in 2019, there actually was a little bit of recovery. There were some trees that were still alive. There was some ground cover that was coming back. Um, what is really difficult in modeling is seeing what happens with climate in years out. So 2020 was one of our hottest years. It was in non as people call it. If you go back out in that watershed, we had huge mortality. So there's a lot of trees that uh, could not take that stress. They're already stressed from the fire. Additional stress from a drought and from record heat uh, killed quite a few. And a lot of that ground cover went as well. So uh, it's, it's really difficult to model the recovery of the watershed accurately at this time. Uh, I will say that one of the, the models, the sediment models that uh, Christopher's group, the county uh, commissioned, uh, that was run by Natural Channel Design, uh, did take out the sediment portion. So this is sediment specific, not so much the water. And they're shown for a five-year period that there would be very little recovery in terms of sediment delivery. So still, that's the, one of the reasons why the county uh, and the Forest Service and ourselves at the city are pushing for that sediment mitigation, sediment um, recovery upstream of the cities. We, there, we do see a continued threat as far out as that particular suite of models show, which is about five years. And I see that Chris, Christopher put his video on, so if he wants to talk a little bit more, I'll let him jump back in. Yeah, I don't, I don't think we've truly quantified the recovery of the watershed or understand um, where you know what it's going to look like as much uh, recovery in some parts of it that we may have seen is uh, somewhat offset by the erosion that's taken place and uh, the, the channels that have uh, been in size that are more efficiently now issuing water out of the watershed and so um, we're hoping to to look at the watershed um, this spring and look at uh, what vegetation growth is coming in and uh, and do somewhat of an assessment on it but uh, right now, all of our efforts have been focused on uh, downstream uh, flood mitigation. But uh, like Julie mentioned, there's there's groups that are looking at it. But um, we know that the long-term uh, prognosis is that it, the watershed is going to be compromised uh, for many years. Great. Thank you all so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Vice Mayor has a question. Thank you, Mayor. And thank you again, staff. Uh, Sarah, I have a couple of questions for you. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the city and the county for going door to door, because I think that that is really important um, for conveying the information and giving residents a chance to ask questions right there on the spot. I'm wondering um, whether there are any plans for meetings. I mean, even if they're the, the meetings that we did last summer with the maps and we'd be in different locations and people would come or maybe a big community meeting. Thank you, Vice Mayor and uh, Scott, feel free to jump in as well. I know we've had these conversations um, uh, internally. 
But uh, the thought right now is that um, we are planning to meet with uh, Coconino County to our, the flood control district to um, kind of have that, that coordination discussion and see what that will look like for um, kind of pre-monsoon season. Um, so I think those meetings would be kind of focused on gearing up for the next monsoon season and letting residents know uh, how they can be best prepared. Um, in terms of project mitigations, we're thinking that the, um, the channels that we've set up currently are, are working really well for that in terms of an e-newsletter, um, going door to door for affected property owners, um, you know, videos, project website, an email that people can send their questions to, um, and then having those, those larger scale community meetings for kind of pre-monsoon season. Okay. Um, and I guess kind of along those lines, I'm hearing from residents and, and we've talked about this several times and I understand the timeline that staff is giving um, regarding sandbags and dumpsters and removing old sand. Um, but residents have been reminding me that um, that taking down any sandbags and putting up new sandbags and doing all of that work takes a lot of planning on their part um, around their normal schedules. Um, and so the urging that, that I've heard is that you plan on doing that uh, sooner rather than later because I believe there's some anxiety around making sure that the residents have time to gather friends and family to help them with whatever is going to be going on. Yeah, thank you, Vice Mayor. This is Scott, and I'll, I'll chime in on this question. So you did raise this at our last monthly meeting, and uh, we do hear from residents as well that are anxious for these directions. I will tell you that um, the engineering teams talk about it often, and we are also in agreement that um, these short-term mitigations will need to stay in place. They're working well. They're effective. They're um, using sandbags and barriers has been a good means to protect property and life. Um, we are not likely going to change that advice for this coming monsoon season. Uh, we have targeted April 1st as kind of our internal deadline for having all of our pieces and parts in place. We have started to meet. Um, we do have some uh, pretty high-level conversations coming up quickly to talk about what the expectations will be and what our role will be, both as a city and as a county. Um, in the years past, it has been a joint effort, primarily led by the county and their sandbag efforts. Um, production is the big concern. We've also utilized those outside agencies like United Way and volunteer groups. Um, so we know there's this big effort. We know everyone's hungry for it. I think we can tell you two things. One. I would still continue to think that we are going to move towards almost exactly what we saw in the last couple of years um, in terms of what is in place needs to be in place. Um, the logistics of moving in some sandbags, making sure trash is taken care of, um, helping the elderly and those that are in most need, um, all of those conversations are now underway and we will have a more formal rollout to, to you as a governing body, the flood control district and our citizens um, prior to April, but uh, it just hasn't been real timely yet. And that was the meeting that Sarah was speaking to. We would like to hold our, our uh, opportunity to have a larger community dialogue when the time might be most appropriate. And we feel like this topic actually might be a really good community outreach meeting to work on how do you shore up your short-term mitigation and where can you get resources if you're in need of assistance. Uh, so those conversations are underway. We are working that issue. Uh, but we want to make sure we are also on the same page. And then there's a financial aspect. It's expensive to do this work. So uh, we want to make sure that all the people that are in the know understand what it's going to look like and what it's going to cost, not only the flood control district, but the city and, and county resources from a financial standpoint. Thank you, Scott. Um, stay there. Okay. Because I have another question. Um, the spruce wash behind um, the residents, the residences on Grandview, is that scheduled to be dredged? So I appreciate you think I would know this answer, but I'm gonna defer to um, Ed Shank on this one um, as this would be more of a stormwater maintenance question. And I wanna make sure it's right. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, 
there's a few areas that still need some sediment removal from, from last year, but in terms of a channel improvement, so a, a dredge to improve the channel to a larger capacity, uh, we do not have that on our radar at this moment. Uh, to do so, we'd have to do a no adverse impact analysis. Um, I don't see much improvement really being done at the moment. I mean, Linda Vista culvert is the same capacity roughly as Cedar Avenue culvert. They're both very small compared to the flows we've been seeing. Um, so dredging that channel would probably not provide much relief to those Grandview residents, unfortunately. Okay, thank you. And, and I don't know who this question is for. Um, can someone describe to me the, the oversight of contractors and the evaluation of an effectiveness, the, the evaluation of the effectiveness of the mitigation projects? You know, once we, we get a rain, um, get a storm, um, wh what does that process look like? So again, I might lean on Christopher a little bit, or maybe even Andy, who's got experience in the Schultz wash area. Um, in the interim, we have construction projects underway and we have high quality engineering teams, our private engineers of design of record, and then we have project managers that are really looking out for the interests of the taxpayer, the citizens, and the actual project. Um, I think your question actually goes one step further, which is how do we prove up or hold them accountable um, in these projects. So, so Christopher, if you can help me with that piece of the question, and if I'm not answering correct, correctly, Vice Mayor, let me know. Thank you. Well, can I ask, can I start Vice Mayor with a question to answer your question? Are you, sure. uh, are you referring to the long-term flood mitigation or even the short-term uh, mitigation that's been in place? Uh, the short-term that's being done now. Uh, so the, oh, the, the, just what the process is, I know it's it's complicated by different jurisdictions um, and different contractors, but if you could just help me understand the, the process for overseeing all of that, and then also um, what you're looking ahead to do to, um, to evaluate the effectiveness of yes. the project you've done. Sure. So... Uh... It's great that the local engineering community is uh, is the bulk of the people that are at the table with the county and the city and helping us uh, pull apart this uh, this flooding problem and helping us develop flood mitigation strategies. And even for the emergency mitigation measures, like we uh, we in a sense assigned uh, different areas to different engineering groups. And uh, we kind of divided and conquered during flood events. And so um, the same people are looking at that area. They get there as soon as they can during or after a flood event. And they're evaluating the effectiveness of uh, the mitigation that's in place. And, and that's what largely happened this monsoon season. And then as we move forward, uh, we'll certainly continue to do the same thing. There's uh, city staff, county staff, and uh, engineering uh, consultants that uh, get out, take, when it's safe, uh, I should say that, that when it's safe and appropriate, they get out and they take videos of, uh, of the mitigation and, uh, and what's happening. And it's, uh, it's somewhat an evolving process because the water in the system is so dynamic with all the sediment. And that mm -hmm. at any given time, we can have such a plug of sediment come through that it may block uh, channels and, uh, and push water in different directions. And so there's a very dynamic nature of the system uh, with all the sediment and, uh, and, and it evolves and our strategy evolves. But to answer your question, is, uh, it's, it's uh, boots on the ground and then, and it's also going back to the modeling analysis of it and, and plugging in different parameters as we see uh, things change and, uh, and come up with, uh, with more or refined mitigation uh, strategies. Thank you. I very much appreciate that. And that is all of my questions, I think. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilmember McCarthy. 
Thank you. I have a leading question. In other words, a question for Julie Lead. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm sorry, you shouldn't laugh. It wastes too much time. Um, what, when you do the modeling, you obviously have to assume a certain flow rate. And how does that flow rate that you assume compare to the flow rate that we actually saw last summer? Does that, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Council Member McCarthy, so the, um, we maximize the capacity by saying how big of a box culvert can we fit and still work within the right of way and not um, block sewering. Um, and so we backed into, well, how much can that convey? And that was about that 1100 CFS at the pinch point, which is at the very downstream end at Route 66. How that compares to what we experienced this summer, um, it is within the range of what we experienced on our, on our couple big storms. Um, I believe there, was, there, there are not um, flow gauges out there to say definitively it was this many CFS that we saw in August. Um, but we know we're pretty close to that, um, perhaps just a, a little bit under what the, the flood event that we saw in August. So in the flow rates above the detention basin down at the school could actually be higher uh, and you would still only get 1100 CFS down below because the, the basin will kind of like um, put a lag in, this, in the system, if that's a good word. In other words, slow it down and meter it out more slowly. So you might get 1500 CFS up high and only get 1,100 CFS down at the below the basins. So Thank I you. think you kind of answered your, my question as close as is possible. Well, thank you for bringing that up because I was thinking there was one thing I wanted to clarify and it was a question from Council Member Shimoni and that was a, a good, so if, if you don't mind. Um, so one thing that I had said and Vice Mayor Daggett had asked a follow up too is, um, you know, we've got this situation where we have the Wash Street, uh, West Street Wash joining with Spruce right there on first in the underground system, and we've got a situation there. Well, the investment that you're making in the Killip detention basins helps that because it does. It attenuates some of that flow. It holds it back and releases it a little bit more slowly. So as it's held back and released a little bit more slowly, that allows perhaps some other water to clear out of that system downstream. So that's really the strategy, is looking for those places for detention um, where you can hold back that water and release it more slowly so you can maximize the capacity of your downstream in infrastructure where you don't have perhaps that opportunity to upsize it to something much larger. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council Member Shimoni. Thank you, and, and Julie, you can stay seated, but I guess my, my thought is, and you know, just processing everything we're talking about, and, and Ed, your, your comments too. So it sounds like maybe in five or so years, um, we might see a decline in the, that, the, amount, the volume. Um, is that a fair <laughs> thought? <laughs> or under, I guess, yeah, Andy? Councilmember uh, Shimoni, members of the council, uh, thanks for letting me speak this evening. I'm sorry I haven't spoken yet, but as you can see, we're kind of a team of interchangeable parts and we can easily steal one another's uh, thunder. Um, but uh, that's the beauty of this team, kind of being able to step in and, and a lot of people working on a lot of different things. I wish we could stand up here and just celebrate the Killup project. Um, that shouldn't be overlooked as to the significance of that project, particularly the partnerships, the, the legal dynamics that took place between the two entities and just to make that happen for the community. And now working upstream and to convey the water to that area with no adverse impact, both through temporary mitigation measures, sandbags and barriers, and then the larger channel work. Um, and I'm gonna use the S word in the Schultz area we talked about this same thing, and that fire occurred back in 2010. The subsequent flooding de uh, destroyed the water line coming to the city of Flagstaff and destroyed several homes in, in the community. And I think today, uh, with the work that's been done, I don't know if we can say what would that look like if we the, 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 the hadn't done anything. 
And I don't think we'll be able to look at this one and say, what would it look like if we didn't do anything? Because we are doing something. We are doing a culmination of a lot of things to um, uh, help the community get through uh, these major storm events. Um, going And thank you, Christopher Tressler, for being here from the Flood Control District. The Flood Control District is working with the, Nas uh, the Coconino National Forest on these sediment basins to kind of help um, that watershed heal, if you will. And so that's the hard part about us humans is we always want to inflict our will on the natural environment to help it along, right? Now, if it were to heal itself, we're saying 10 years, 20 years, it's a long healing process. And a lot of it has to do with the climate models we can predict, it's like the economy, we can kind of predict what's gonna happen, but we don't really know. But we're gonna try to help it along. And I, and I think we're doing the best we can to that end. Um, I wanna thank uh, Scott and Sam, Scott Overton and Sam Beckett for being here tonight. They're responsible for snow operations. This is the first time in a long time, I'm the water services director now, this is the first time in a long time I haven't been. So I'm celebrating this help to our water table, right? Um, sorry, guys. Um, but we're in good hands. Um, and we're looking forward to the day where we can celebrate our monsoon season in East Flagstaff. Uh, because right now, there's a lot of anxiety going into it, as the vice mayor had noted. And so what are we doing to both manage those natural events and manage our anxiety with that? I was able to go by, I was in our east side shop last week, went by the Coconino County Public Works uh, facility. Sorry, Christopher, to tell your secrets. They have several sandbags made, covered, waiting. Is it going to be enough? Probably not. And so uh, ramping up those resources to make those sandbags, NAU, volunteer efforts, uh, Arizona Conservation Corps, ACE crews, uh, who, whoever is able to help. And so it's an on hands on deck mentality. And so, but right now we're doing everything we can to kind of help those natural processes along to get to a place where these next five, 10, 15, 20 years we can celebrate monsoon season as opposed to being fearful for them. Because right now we're, we're, we're managing through them um, and um, it's, it's a very difficult situation. So I didn't really answer your question, um, but natural processes, as you know, particularly forest health healing, takes quite some time. The vegetation looks different. We lost a lot of pine trees. What's going to come up? Aspens tend to take over. Uh, they just have a different rooting type system. Schultz, we see, is healing. People are studying that watershed. At the same time, we also know that some things we did to help that watershed along have been helpful to the community. And I think today, uh, as I drive through, compared to 10 years ago, healing has taken place, and there's a sense of uh, relief when monsoon season comes around. So. Andy, thank you, and I'm glad you had the opportunity to get up here and say something. I, I, I try not to steal everyone's thunder, just because we have such a great team, and they're, they're great people, and especially Sarah with the communication efforts, and because we know in our roles that we can all huddle up and talk about from an engineering standpoint, what are we going to do, but if we're not getting it out there, then there is that always anxiety going forward, uh, and um, just making sure that we're getting our voices uh, and we're listening as well. And I think um, we're, we're um, setting ourselves up to continue to improve it at that. Andy, thank you. And that leads me to my hopefully final question, and that is for Sarah. So Sarah, <laughs> that was a perfect transition. Uh, Sarah, you know, I just pulled up the city's homepage on, on the, the, home, the website and also the county's homepage. And I was just wondering if the county, you know, not only recognizes COVID as like a top bar emergency update link, but I was wondering if the county also acknowledged the, the flooding issues and they sure enough they did. And, and I noticed on our website, it's kind of hard to find where the flooding information is. And, and, and so I'm just wondering if there could be potentially a shortcut added to our homepage, kind of like we do for COVID-19 in regards to museum flooding mitigation, where we can kind of have like a catch-all, really easy direct click. What, what do you, do you have any thoughts about that? 
Yeah, thank you, Councilmember Shimoni. Um, we did have that last summer. Um, so where you see COVID is actually called an emergency alert within Civic Plus. Um, so we like to retain that for, um, you know, current active emergencies. Um, and that's why we had it up last summer during kind of an active monsoon season when there, when there was a, a threat of, of flooding fairly frequently. Um, so we'll definitely be adding that again this winter, or sorry, this uh, summer as, a, as an emergency alert. But we can also do um, somewhere else on the homepage some sort of um, quick shortcut to our, our new website. I can definitely add that. That's Thank great. You. And I'm just, you know, looking through it as a re going over the resident section, I can imagine it falling within residence, but uh, I'll let you determine where that goes because I, I don't know. But somewhere intuitive, yep. I think, is key to me. And I, I think that's great. And then also, I think on that page, on that landing page, if we could also link to the county's landing page for their um, museum flood area, they've got a ton of good links, links to videos, really good information that, you know, we should definitely be piggybacking. And, and stealing their thunder <laughs> to <laughs> yes. help communicate, as Andy was saying. But um, thank you, um, and, and that's all for you, Sarah, thank you. And my last comment is to our city manager. I just wanted to say thank you for your leadership and efforts overseeing all this. Uh, we, as a community, really appreciate that, and, and, and our team has been working really hard on all these things, but I, I do think that having someone at the top that's really pushing and, and has clarity and wants to see this through is, is very helpful. So I know that you care deeply about this and uh, we, we really appreciate your leadership and work on this. Thank you, council member. Um, as has been demonstrated in this presentation, it truly is a team effort. The, the team goes well beyond the organization. We have excellent outside expertise helping and we have numerous divisions involved in this. So uh, it's very collaborative. Thank you for your comments. Thank you, and thank you for letting me ask all my questions tonight. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Um, any other or further questions, comments um, before moving forward? I'm not seeing any this time. Well, thank you for the update yet again and for all the efforts that are going into this. It's clear, especially as we see this month to month uh, in front of us on council, how much work is being done um, very quickly. Uh, and we, we are very appreciative for it and all the partnerships and teamwork that it has taken to get to this point and continuing forward. With that, we are down to agenda item number seven, which is uh, general public participation. Do we have anyone on the line? Mayor, we do not at this time. Thank you. Then that brings us to the info items, two from mayor, council, and city manager, and future agenda item requests. Um, with that, let's go in reverse roll call order. How about that? Um, starting with council member Sweet. Mr. Mayor, can I uh, interject, please? Yes, of course. Greg Clifton here, city manager. I'm wondering if I could uh, offer some comments uh, to preface your to and from discussion. I know I'm out of turn in doing so. Uh, this could be pretty quick on my part, if that's okay. Absolutely. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, Mayor, council, just a quick comment here before we have our to and from as it relates to uh, staffing and workload. I know that the council is aware of our continued shortage of staffing uh, attributed to recruitment challenges, which are not unique to the city of Flagstaff, uh, but also retention issues. Um, and we're working on all fronts. We had a very good discussion of this earlier today. Amidst uh, these challenges, we continue to see a significant allocation of work and tasks that we will soon be uh, providing you an update uh, with respect to the fair items in the queue, but also other requests uh, that have been uh, forthcoming. Uh, we think that'll be a worthy exercise and we're just not quite ready to do that, but we do have plan on having it in front of you soon. Um, we just wanted to um, offer up at this point a reminder, I guess, um, uh, respectfully asking you to be mindful of the challenges that we're faced with our current staffing situation as it is and always remains our intent to serve you as the council in the most efficient and effective manner. So thank you, for, thank you for letting me share those comments. Thank you, city manager, and definitely understand the 
um, difficulties being faced to fulfill. We have a very long list at this point. And um, yeah, I, I appreciate you bringing that up. Uh, with that, we'll turn it over to council members, uh, starting with council member Sweet. Thank you, Mayor. Let me get my camera on. Um, thank you everyone for the flood update tonight. I don't really have anything. Uh, just hoping everyone gets home safe who's in person. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Shimoni. Thank you, Mayor, and, and good meeting today, everybody. I thought that was, we covered a lot of ground. Uh, just a couple things. Um, just wanna give a shout out to uh, Metro Plan and for helping to to welcome the, the the ADOT Board of Transportation members last Friday. Uh, it was a really good event here in the chambers. We had a, a pretty decent showing. Uh, Mayor, yourself, and many others were, were here. And I thought that was very worthwhile. And I thought it was really good to meet their, their staff and their elected or their uh, board members. Uh, I thought that was very beneficial. Um, just a couple things. Just want to give a shout out to our snowplow operations and all the staff that are working 24-7 to keep our streets clean. We appreciate you. Um, and it seems like we're definitely going to be getting some snow. Uh, the Flagstaff High School women's team is in the semifinals and they are competing this Thursday at 3 p.m. here at Flag High. I will be going. I'm very excited about that. And if they win, they will have a chance to compete at the state level next Monday in Phoenix. Um, over the weekend, I dived deep into the Strong Towns movement in their YouTube channel. And if you haven't heard of the Strong Towns movement, I highly recommend you look them up and check out their YouTube channel. It's an incredible effort to totally flip the script on how we prioritize the way we build our, our roads. And it's very exciting and very much in line with what we're talking about here at the city. And this Thursday from 11 a.m. to noon, they have an online hour long, let's fix, a let's fix a dangerous street in 24 hours or less conference discussion of which I will be attending. It's $25 to attend. And if anyone needs a link to that, let me know and I'd be happy to share that with you. Um, this upcoming Monday, the county is putting on their COVID-19 partners update, and I look forward to that and thank the county for that. And um, we also, I think it's a, a bunch of us from council will be having a tour of NACET um, this Friday, I believe. Yeah, uh, no, I apologize. I think it's on Monday, Monday from 2 to 3 p.m. We're going to be touring the NACET campus, and I look forward to that. So thank you in advance to those who are helping to orchestrate that. And, and then this Friday, you know, I'm sure Council Member Austin Aslan will be speaking to it, but I look forward to that, the, the water meeting, um, and I'll let Council Member Aslan speak more to it. And, and lastly, I just want to congratulate and express appreciation to Heidi Hansen for stepping up and helping the city through these challenging times and, and taking on additional responsibility on behalf of the city. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor, and, and good work, everybody. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Salas. Um, thank you, Team Flagstaff, and thank you, Team Reddy Coconino, and everyone um, working 24 7 to keep us safe and sound during this uh, snowstorm. Um, it's still Arizona Beer Week. And please support our eight breweries, namely Beaver Street, Dark Sky Brewing Company, Flag Brew, Grand Canyon Brewing Company, Historic Brewing, Lumberyard Brewing Company, Mother Road, and Wanderlust. Uh, we have uh, our Discover Flagstaff uh, uh, website has uh, links uh, to uh, all discounts and, and events uh, the rest of the week for Arizona Beer Week. And there's also uh, um, a website called flag, uh, craftbeerflg.com. So it's, it's also, it's also uh, housed uh, on the discoverflagstaff.com website. And I have a fair item. 
so and I'm very mindful of uh, of our our um, staff load and our continuing challenge of, with staff retention. And I, I heard I heard the city manager's message earlier loud and clear. Um, in light of this council's recent approval of the ten-year housing plan, I urge this current council to bring back the city-owned parcel on Charles Pass to the list of properties to be developed for workforce housing. Three years ago, I was the fourth voice on council to hold off development of this property for housing in, antip in anticipation of a citizen's initiative to preserve and protect this parcel for open space with the condition that the proponents of the citizen initiative will figure out to pay back or recover the costs the city has incurred in terms of redevelopment, which is est estimated at that time at over $500,000. However, the citizens uh, initiative seems to have fizzled out. Now I urge this current council to resume the original intent of the property on Charles Pass, which is owned by the city, to develop it for, for uh, workforce housing and ex ex expedite this fair item. Thank you. And be safe, everyone. Stay warm and dry. Thank you, Councilmember McCarthy. Uh, thank you, Mayor. The only thing I had on my list originally was uh, the State Transportation Board, which met uh, in this very room last Friday, and there was uh, quite a bit of uh, council support making comments, and the meet and greet we had before where we actually got to talk to the board members face-to-face -face was very productive. So I want to thank all the council members that, that showed up, and uh, Mountain Line and the FMPO, et cetera. Um, the only other thing I'll say is that I am supportive of a discussion that uh, Ms. Salas just asked to have about the Schultz Pass um, property. I was a no vote on that. I said, no, let's not develop it. But uh, I'm willing to uh, participate on a, uh, another discussion about that site. So uh, thank you, Regina Salas. That's it for tonight. Thank you, Councilmember Aslan. I don't have anything um, except I will mention just because Councilmember Shimoni brought it up. Uh, we have our monthly, regularly scheduled Coconino Plateau Water Advisory Council meeting uh, last Friday of every month. That's this Friday morning. It begins at 10 a.m. Um, and that's all I'll say. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Aslan. Vice Mayor. Nothing for me tonight. Thank you. And thank you, staff, for um, for answering all my questions. Thank you. Um, and I will, um, tonight I am, uh, don't have anything further. So uh, thank you all. And with that, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Have a good evening. Stay safe out there. Thanks all. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. 450.